Asia, it's news time with ITN. From ITN News at 10 with John Suchet. Lamb prices plunge despite assurances it's safe. Princess of Wales isolated as her key aide resigns. Drama at Buckingham Palace as lightning strikes guests. And police ask, who is this boy found abandoned in the bushes? Good evening. The price of lamb at market plunged today by as much as 10%, despite assurances in both London and Brussels that it is safe to eat. Fears about lamb were raised after laboratory tests showed that sheep could, theoretically, contract mad cow disease. The Agriculture Minister, Douglas Hogg, said a European ban on some sheep parts should not be allowed to cause a crisis similar to the one over beef. Our health correspondent, Anya Sitharam, reports. Under scrutiny over its safety tonight, lamb. At this hotel, which specialises in British meats, chefs were exasperated at the new link with BSE. The original uh, thought was, oh no, not another food scare. Um, we've had enough of our British food under the microscope recently. We all have 100% uh, in our products and we're very proud to be here cooking and serving English food. In Brussels, the Agriculture Minister Douglas Hogg and the European Commissioner for Farming Franz Fischler were beginning a damage limitation exercise. Asked if lamb is safe, Mr Hogg replied... Oh yes, yes, yes. What we were dealing with, what we are dealing with, is a theoretical risk. That is to say, it has been shown that it is possible to transmit BSE to sheep. And therefore, out of an abundance of caution, as a precautionary measure, um, the various advisors, including SEAC, have recommended the, that we exclude various parts of the carcass. So which parts of the animal will be banned? Brain, spinal tissue and spleen are the likely choices. Which foods are affected? Some types of lamb chops are because they contain spinal cord. So too are lamb brains, a French delicacy. But processed, low-cost foods like meat pies aren't because they rarely contain lamb. The question is, is there a risk? The meat industry says lamb chops are safe because butchers already remove spinal tissue and only older animals above 12 months may be infected. Lamb should be completely safe to eat. Uh, mainly it comes from young animals. We've had a feed ban in place since 1988. Um, I, I would be amazed if there's any risk at all from, from sheep. 480, 480, 480, Despite such assurances, prices at this West Country auction fell by 10% today. Elsewhere, shoppers had mixed views. I feel very concerned, really. So we've stopped eating lamb, stopped eating beef. I prefer lamb to any other kind of meat, actually. So. And I certainly wouldn't put me off eating things like haggis. It's too early to tell if we're on the verge of a lamb crisis. Significantly, consumer groups have welcomed the proposed ban as a precautionary measure. Anya Sitharam, News at 10. One of the Princess of Wales's top aides resigned tonight amid reports of disagreements between them. An official statement said media advisor Jane Atkinson had left because of a reduction in the princess's work commitment. It follows Diana's decision to sever connections with a hundred charities, which was widely criticised. Here's our royal correspondent, Nicholas Owen. This way, please, ma'am. This way, please. The first glimpse the world at large had of Jane Atkinson in January when it was announced she'd taken on the tricky job of handling the princess's relations with the media. A one-time secretary who eventually rose to run her own public relations company, many wondered from the start whether she could cope with a client who was bound to make very difficult demands. Till then, this man, Geoffrey Crawford, one of the Buckingham Palace press spokesmen, had worked for Diana. Both he and her most important aide, Private Secretary Patrick Jefferson, eventually decided they could no longer tolerate not being kept informed of Diana's plans, like her decision to give the famous Panorama interview. A few weeks ago, the Princess in Chicago, a visit carefully stage managed by Jane Atkinson, seen here on the plane to Chicago, planning the trip with Diana's secretary, Angela Horden, one of the few staff who's now left. That'll be there uh, by the time we arrive. And I will probably go over earlier. Most who came into contact with Miss Atkinson reckoned she did her exacting job with professional skill. This was the night the princess agreed to divorce Prince Charles. She's extremely sad. She's very sorry that it's come to this. And um, what more can I say? 
but it's thought the reaction last week to Diana's decision to quit as patron or president of 100 charities led an increasingly strained relationship to breaking point. The princess unhappy that the press reacted so negatively as she saw it. Diana's office insists tonight that the break is due to a reduction in the princess's work commitments. But most royal observers reckon it was a working relationship that couldn't have continued much longer. For once, the spokesman was not speaking. Jane Atkinson has had no comment to make, and she's not being replaced. Nicholas Owen, News at 10, Central London. Two women were knocked unconscious by lightning at a Buckingham Palace garden party today. Both were given emergency treatment at the scene and are staying in hospital overnight. The Queen had already taken shelter from the storm in a tea tent about 50 yards away and was unhurt. ITN's Helen Wright reports. Sheltering under umbrellas, Prince Philip and the Queen just after the lightning strike at Buckingham Palace. They were in the royal tea tent when the storm hit. The garden party is the first to be disrupted by such a serious incident. Police and ambulance crews called in to treat the two injured women. A lot of people in the garden were sheltering under the larger trees. Two women were under the trees, one of whom had, had, a, uh, had with them an umbrella. It was open, obviously, and the, there was a lightning strike. Fortunately, it didn't hit the tree, but it hit the umbrella. Both ladies went down and uh, were cut some bruises. Nothing more than that at the moment, but both have been detained in hospital for the time being. There was sort of like a twisted umbrella on the lawn and two people lying on the ground and an ambulance came. Well, there were uh, two bodies uh, lying near the tree. Um, uh, one of them I saw with their shoes off um, and the feet looked quite blue, so I assume they must have taken the shoes off them. And uh, crowded around by uh, a couple of police officers and some ambulance officers. The women are tonight being treated for burns. The Queen has asked police to keep her informed of their progress. And the storms across the southeast claimed other victims tonight. 14 Italian students are in hospital after another lightning strike. Helen Wright, News at 10, Central London. French police today charged a man with the rape and murder of the British schoolgirl Caroline Dickinson. The man was arrested on Saturday. Police say he is a harmless vagrant who already has a criminal record for rape. Caroline, who was on a school trip to France, was killed while she slept in her dormitory at a youth hostel in Brittany. John Major and Tony Blair today traded blows over Europe and the single currency in their last Commons confrontation before the summer break. Following the resignation of the Treasury Minister David Hethcote Amory, Mr Blair accused the Prime Minister of weak leadership. When Mr Major mentioned Labour's own Eurosceptics, Mr Blair immediately disowned them. With details of that and today's ministerial reshuffle, here's our political editor, Michael Brunson. This was the nice part of the Prime Minister's day, dropping in on a summer holiday scheme for civil servants' children. Later, more grief on Europe and the single currency. But while he was enjoying video football, the former Treasury Minister David Hethcote Amory was using his post-resignation freedom to criticise Mr Major's stand on Europe quite openly. And in the end, what should have been a handy weapon for a counter-attack, the fact that some Labour MPs were publishing their pamphlet, criticising their leader over Europe, didn't quite work at question time. Challenged by Mr Blair as to whether he, like the Chancellor, could ever actually contemplate signing Britain up to a single currency, Mr Major began waving the Labour pamphlet. Perhaps the right honourable gentleman can tell the House whether he agrees with the argumentation in this pamphlet. A pamphlet produced by Labour mem members of Parliament which brought Labour as a member of Parliament squabbling in public this morning. You asked me whether I could agree with the pamphlet. The answer is no, I don't agree with it. Yeah. Right. Now let it, let's get a clear answer from him yeah. as to where he stands. Yeah. Then Paddy Ashdown joined in the attack. Is it not time for the Prime Minister to lead his exhausted and divided party out of power and fight their civil wars somewhere else. Yeah. Rather losing on the afternoon's points, Mr Major said Mr Ashdown should have mentioned the way the economy had revived under the Tories. And when that is happening because of the policies of this government that his tiny party has objected to throughout this parliament. In the reshuffle, the chief beneficiary is the rising Tory star David Willits in the centre here, who hasn't been shuffled at all, but remains as part of Michael Heseltine's team, but with Minister of State rank now and the title of Paymaster General. The other noteworthy change comes as the traditionally all-male team of Tory government whips is joined for the first time by a woman, Jackie Lay. Not that she's going to let that be a problem. I have worked all of my life in male-dominated organisations. I don't think there's a single thing that could happen that I haven't heard or seen before. 
Tonight, Labour people are gleefully pointing out that in Margaret Beckett, they had a woman government whip 20 years ago. Tomorrow, we shall see whether another Labour woman, Harriet Harman, keeps her place after the shadow cabinet elections. The betting is tonight that she will. Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. Police are tonight anxious to trace the mother of a young boy apparently abandoned under park bushes. The boy, aged three or four, was found asleep in a park in Bournemouth. He's apparently in good spirits. Vernon Mann reports. He's three, maybe four years old. Police can't quite make out whether he's called Stephen or Nathan. Whatever his name, he's without his parents tonight, being cared for by social workers. He was discovered asleep, apparently abandoned under bushes near a community centre in Bournemouth by a woman walking in the park. Police say he's well nourished and in good spirits. They hope these pictures will help someone identify him. He said he went to the park with his mother. I was there. I didn't go to him after there. I just went to the park and then I come here. Police say someone saw her. This child was asleep across both her arms. Um, she was carrying a large holdall and seemed to be struggling with the weight of both the holdall and the child. And uh, eventually made towards the park area, returning some five minutes later without the child. Um, she went towards the direction from which she'd come, and, and that is as much as we know. Stephen, or Nathan, had a happy hour messing about in a police car. But he was missing his mum by the end of the day. He's mentioned Hemel Hempstead in Hertfordshire, and officers there have been alerted. Police say his mother could be emotionally distressed. Meanwhile, it was time for bed. Vernon Mann, News at 10. Blackmailer who's been conducting a letter bomb campaign against Barclays Bank is now threatening the Sainsbury's supermarket chain. Police revealed today that the man who calls himself Mardi Gras had demanded a considerable amount of money in a letter sent two weeks ago. Sainsbury said extra security measures were being taken. ITN's Colin Baker reports. For the last 11 days, undercover police officers have mounted a series of covert operations in Sainsbury's supermarkets to try to catch the extortionist known as Mardi Gras. Sainsbury's head office received a letter from Mardi Gras threatening to leave explosive devices on their premises unless a considerable sum of money was paid. We're taking this very seriously and putting it, all, all, the, um, all the effort that we have and all the means at our disposal to reduce this risk very substantially. Scotland Yard advised Sainsbury's to go public. Today the police displayed some of the cartridges and bullets used to cause explosions in some of the devices made by the extortionist. Twenty-five small bombs were assembled. Most of them were sent through the post. The target for the majority, Barclays Banks, which received the first one in December 1994. Most of the devices, like this one, which used a small cupboard bolt, were assembled from materials readily found in the home or hardware shops. Clearly the devices that he puts together take some time to construct uh, with some degree of care and uh, it might be the sort of person slightly reclusive, perhaps slightly obsessive. It's very easy to do this kind of thing. It's very easy to make the devices if you have the expertise, which he has, uh, and of course it's very easy to send them in the mail. Uh, the answer to it is to do exactly as Sainsbury's are doing, which is to stand firm on it and keep the police and the public and their staff fully employed. The police say that their assessment of the risk to the public is low and confined to London and the South East. Nevertheless, they urge vigilance for those using banks and supermarkets. Colin Baker, News at 10, New Scotland Yard. There are calls tonight for a judge to resign after he halted the trial of a policeman accused of fondling two female officers. Judge Alistair McCallum told Bradford Crown Court it would have been better to have given the policeman a sound ticking off. From Bradford, here's our North of England reporter, Tony Barnes. PC Robert Briddle was suspended from duty two years ago after it was alleged he'd indecently assaulted two women police officers and a civilian at Halifax Police Station. Bradford Crown Court heard he'd approached one WPC from behind and held her breasts, that he'd sat astride another, tried to kiss her and touched her breast on another occasion. 
He denied the charges and today Judge Alistair McCallum directed not guilty verdicts on all four indecent assault charges. The judge said horseplay and sexual banter were common at the police station and he added the appropriate way of dealing with him is for his superior officer to give him a sound ticking off and make sure he doesn't behave in a way which most people find unacceptable. The detective who investigated the case was outraged. I didn't think judges said things like that these days. Uh, these police officers, these women police officers, have been very brave to come out and say what's happened to them when many people have kept their mouths shut for years and years and years, thinking that the system would support them. West Yorkshire Police defended their decision to bring the case to court, saying it sent a clear signal that physical abuse and harassment is totally unacceptable. They added they'll robustly pursue other action against the police officer. PC Briddle's solicitor said as his client had been found not guilty, further action against him would be inappropriate. Tony Barnes, News at 10, Bradford. At least 10 people have died after flash floods hit the Canadian province of Quebec. Thousands have been forced from their homes and dozens of houses have been swept away. The damage has been estimated at several hundred million dollars. Holidaymakers in West Wales may find this hard to believe, but the region is still facing an environmental catastrophe following the sinking of the Sea Empress oil tanker in February. It appears that a miracle has happened, the beaches are clear and the birds are breeding again. But experts say that below the surface, disaster beckons. Our science editor, Lawrence McGinty, went to investigate for tonight's special report. The scene last February, 200 miles of beach despoiled by the black tide that oozed from the Sea Empress. On Tembe Beach, two of the 20,000 seabirds killed by the clinging crude. But now children play on the same spot. The battle for Tembe Beach has been won. The shores of West Wales are back as they should be. Nearby, Skomer Island, the most important seabird sanctuary in southern Britain. Here, the birds are back, as they should be, clinging to their homes on the cliffs. There are 20% fewer guillemots mating than last year, but most species seem to have escaped harm from the oil. At first sight, oil from the Sea Empress hasn't caused the kind of disaster originally feared on nature reserves like this one here on Skomer. But scientists warn there could be trouble brewing for bird populations, especially because of what's happening further down the food chain. What we're most worried about is the impact on sand eels, because this is a crucial little beast you know, that feeds so many um, um, larger animals, including seabirds and, and, and others. Puffins need sand eels to feed themselves and their young in their burrows. Seabirds generally would starve without the rich harvest of small food animals from the beaches. Four months ago, that larder was despoiled by oil from the Empress. Animals like limpets were wiped out, threatening their predators, and so ultimately, the birds that eat them. These shores near the scene of the disaster are unique because they've been continuously studied for 50 years. Last February, scientists started to plot the scale of the disaster. Four months on, at the same spot, most of the oil has disappeared, but its effects have been disastrous. Because the grazers, like the limpets, the um, top shells, periwinkles, because they've died off, we see the plant eaters have gone, and as a consequence, a great surge in certain growths of weed, the green flush. I think any change in ecology, a dramatic change in ecology, should be considered a, a disaster. On sandy beaches like Angle Bay, dig down and you strike oil. It could take decades to be flushed out naturally. That's why the council is making desperate attempts to dig out the oil. They've even removed whole beaches and are washing the stones in cement mixers to clean off the oil before returning the beaches. But the damage was done back in February even as the oil started to come ashore, when its effects were considerable. Animals that lived in the sand, like these worms on nearby Dale Beach, were slaughtered. The oil contaminated nature's larder, the rich wildlife of the beaches. It's virtually disappeared. We now have uh, a few lugworm, a few ragworm. Uh, there's a few bivalves, uh, mainly young ones, that have actually uh, started developing, but otherwise it's a fairly dead beach. 
Those terrible images of oil spewing from the Sea Empress are becoming memories. The slicks are no longer there. Oil no longer surges onto the beaches, but damage to wildlife is real and could yet spell disaster. Lawrence McGinty, News at 10, Wales. A correction to an earlier story. I inadvertently described the man arrested for the murder of Caroline Dickinson as a harmless vagrant. I should, of course, have said a homeless vagrant. Sports news. Accusations of incompetence against the organisers of the Atlanta Olympics reached new levels today after it was revealed that an armed man beat security to get into the opening ceremony. The man, dressed as a bogus security guard, was arrested before President Clinton and several other world leaders arrived. From Atlanta, Bill Neely reports. Police have no idea how the man got into the Olympics opening event with a gun, bullets and a knife. Somehow he talked his way past guards and a multi-million dollar security system hours before President Clinton arrived. Dozens of other world leaders were in the stadium. 55-year-old Roland Atkins was dressed in a uniform, was seated and was acting suspiciously, say police, when he was challenged. He was asked if he had accreditation. He did not. He was asked if he had a ticket. He had no ticket. He was, at that point, placed under arrest. The Secret Service say he was caught before the president arrived. He has now been released. It's a huge embarrassment to organizers who were boasting of the most secure Olympics in history. They've had six years to prepare for them, yet today they admitted that they were still building the security fence around Olympic Stadium as the Games opened. The perimeter fence was not finished, was not completed, and, and, and uh, the entire area that is now the Olympic stadium cluster was not sealed until a, a very short time before the gates were open. The athlete's bus system isn't working, the computerized results system is breaking down, and now this. Here at the Olympic Village, athletes are trusting that these are just teething troubles. Bill Neely, News at 10, Atlanta. There was sporting controversy in Atlanta as well, with Ireland's double gold swimmer, Michelle Smith, insisting she's not a cheat. She's faced barbed comments from the American media, which is questioning how she managed to get herself into the record books. Here's Graham Miller in Atlanta. A mixed day of celebration for Michelle Smith, a double gold medal winner, but she spent much of her time answering doubts expressed here in America that her success like isn't to, legitimate. To it's because she's come from nowhere to glory, and her coach, whom she married last month, Eric De Bruin, is banned for alleged drug abuse. But Michelle says she's always tested negative. They visited my house when I was home for a weekend in, in Dublin in May, and the same day I had a test by the uh, Irish Olympic Council. Now I, even went, I went back to Holland and the following week Fina were there at my door again. And the Irish team doctor also backs up her case. She has been under the same rigours as all the other girls she lined up with in the pool yesterday, all the girls she lined up in the pool tomorrow. And she, like them, have been tested with the same spectrometry and have come up with the same answer that they are negative. Tim Henman, meantime, lifted British hearts as he reached round two of the men's tennis singles. He beat Japan Shutsu Matsuoka in straight sets. Obviously, throughout the year, we're representing ourselves and uh, with Davis Cup just last week and now, uh, you know, representing Great Britain again in, in the Olympics, it's, uh, you know, it's very special. Beach volleyball made its first appearance today. A curiosity to some, a joke to many more. Britain lost to Australia 15-4. Tomorrow, cyclist Graham Obrey is in action in the 4,000 metres pursuit. He says he's not over here for the sunshine, he's going for gold. Should be quite a day. Graham Miller, News at 10 at the Atlanta Olympics. And that's the news. Good night.
Hello. Well, it's been a thundery evening. Most of these storms have already begun to move away and will continue to do so through the night. Now, all of this activity has been sparked off by the high temperatures we had today. By contrast, though, tomorrow will feel noticeably cooler and fresher for all of us. Temperatures, as you can see there, in fact, five to seven Celsius lower than those we had this afternoon. Now, this change has been brought about by the movement of this weather front. It's moving away over the North Sea over the next 24 hours and it's taking the thunder and the humidity away with it, making things then feel fresher for all all of us. So the best of the weather tomorrow, certainly on the western side of the country, for southwest England, Wales, Northern Ireland and western Scotland. As you can see there, some brightness and just the odd spot of drizzle around the coasts. A different story though for the eastern side of the country. It's going to start gloomy, dull and cloudy with patchy rain and drizzle around, which should largely clear away altogether through the afternoon and that's going to leave us with some brightness away from the North Sea coast. So as I said then, feeling noticeably cooler and fresher for all of us. For instance, we saw highs today of 27 Celsius, tomorrow 19 or 20 at best, and particularly chilly in East Anglia with a brisk northwesterly wind. That's all from me. Good night. Sponsored by PowerJam. Producing electricity, whatever the weather. Hello, good evening from Calendar. The grandparents of missing toddler Ben Needham have made a fresh appeal in Greece today on the eve of the fifth anniversary of his disappearance. This latest attempt comes after a businessman offered a reward of half a million pounds. For nearly 3,000 years, the classical beauty of the Acropolis set on its hill over Athens has been drawing visitors to the city. But for Eddie and Christine Needham from Sheffield, the view is irrelevant. They are not tourists. They arrived in Athens last night for what they believe is their last real hope of finding out what happened to their grandson Ben exactly five years ago. Then, Eddie and Christine were on the island of Kos, where they had come from Yorkshire to start a new life. That July day in 1991, Eddie was renovating an old farmhouse. Christine brought 20-month-old Ben for a picnic. He went out to play and was never seen again. But now his grandparents are back to announce a half million pound reward from an anonymous Somerset businessman for Ben's return. We don't know who it is or how many people are concerned. There may be more than one person. We think we the don't person know. will come forward if Ben's found. If then, Ben's but found. I, I mean, you've got to you've got to abide by their wishes, haven't you? Because it may be something that they don't want anyone else to know about. Today's press conference has been organised by the British Embassy in Athens. The turnout was encouraging. But for the Needhams, yet another emotional occasion in the five years since Ben has disappeared. So now the Needhams must just wait and see whether news of a half million pound reward will have any effect when it's broadcast across the country tonight. Whether articles in tomorrow's newspapers will finally loosen the tongue of someone somewhere who knows what happened to Ben Needham. But Eddie and Chris have much experience of waiting and seeing. A few more days won't make much difference to people who are determined never to give up the search for the grandson who was in their charge. And we apologise for the poor picture quality in that report. We had a problem with satellite. A policeman accused of sexually assaulting two female officers has walked free after his trial was halted. Robert Bridal was told by the judge that he should have had a sound ticking off instead. PC Robert Bridal, who's 41, was accused of fondling two female officers and assaulting a civilian. But the jury was directed to find him not guilty on four charges and he left court a free man. Halting the trial, the judge, Alistair McCallum, said the women hadn't wanted the case to come to court and PC Bridal...